Okay. So, Darkness at Noon, Arthur Kersler, 1940, or Kiesler. Um, I'm recording this because a few people missed it. They had to go on photography trips. Some people have been um, COVIDed. And maybe you'll just want to uh, go through it before you actually write your essay over half term. So, this is our first foray into actually writing a full essay from Paper 2, Section A. Ashton, tell me what the dominant assessment objective is for this. It's all right, Lucy's going to help you out. Yeah. Section A, unseen, dominant assessment objective is. You had to tell you all something. <laughs> Millie? Um, yeah, A02. A02. <laughs> And what is percentage is AO2? 75%. Tell me about our other AOs. There's two more. AO1 and AO3. And what does our AO3 actually mean for this essay? Wider reading. Excellent. So, the majority of our marks are gained from analysing the language in front of us. I want you to imagine that you are a hawk hovering by the motorway side, looking down, waiting for... You're not looking, incidentally, fun fact, for the movement of a tiny shrew, vole or mouse, but you can see in UV. And what you can see are the little urine trails that mice constantly leave as they go anywhere. Didn't know that, did you? I paid attention at the talk at the zoo at Northumberland at the, uh, in the summer holidays. So you are looking down oh God, on your prey, but your prey is the dystopian extract, and the urine trails are the key vocabulary that you are going to snatch up and interrogate for your answer. Okay, what goes in your introduction? Let me tell you. In our introduction, we will always try and say something meaningful about, sorry, the title and the date of publication. Now, is there anything dystopian about our title? Yes. It's not usually dark at noon. It's not usually dark at noon. So, AO2, that is a use of, it's a metaphor, it's oxymoron. Well, not necessarily, mm, I guess it could be dark at noon if there's a big thunderstorm. Definitely juxtaposition. But it could be metaphorical of what? Death. Death. Right, something foreboding. Do we know this word? Like foreshadowing, something's coming, but it bodes ill. Something not very nice. Can't remember which one it is. It says there's a there's a fell scent on the air or something. I'm back to my Lord of the Rings, thinking I might watch it tonight. For the purposes of the recording, you did miss me doing an awesome Gandalf impersonation earlier that was roundly mocked and ridiculed by my students. Uh, 1940, dystopian timeline. What might we expect dystopian writers to be concerned with at this point? Millie? The USSR. What else? Someone said war. What's happening in the 1940s? Rise of fascism. Rise of the guardians. We've got fascism. K -k 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 -k. Communism. Right, okay. Right. So we would put all of that into an introduction, speculating on what we might expect to find in this extract. Uh, we're not going to speculate too much because how many times should you read your extract before you write your essay in the exam? Three times a lady. Skim, scan, scour, skim it through, get the gist. Scan it trying to organise your main themes and then scour 
for your urine. Your scouring is for your mouse urine. All right, put quotations then if you want to be awkward. It's a problem with you, no imagination. Maybe it is. If I come in at the start of that exam and I stand at the front like this with my arms raised and go, you'll all remember what to do, won't you? I don't even care. Put hawk, scour for urine. The invigilators might ask me to leave, or if I need to lie down. Don't even care. Right, okay, so what I'm going to do, like I said, first part of the lesson, I said we'd go through this together. Second part, um, I've put together a planning grid, um, and I'll show you how I've modelled writing an introduction. But, to give you a little bit of challenge, I haven't mentioned the title of the extract. And then what we do is we work through, thematically usually, because what we never want to do is write our essay going chronologically through the extract. Can anyone think why? If I just start writing my essay saying, this is what I see here, and this is what I see here, and this is what I see here, what am I in danger of doing? Repeating myself, exactly. So what I want to do is go, someone give me a theme that's in this text. The theme of time. There's something going on with time. Well done, Neve. And what if it comes up here, and then here, and then here? I'm better off, I've scanned for time, and now I'm scouring, and I'm putting all... I'm not going to write them out again, right? I'm not gonna, I haven't got time for that, but I am going to think how I'm going to organise my quotations on time. Give me another key theme. Control. Lovely. Control has one L, by the way. What else am I in danger of doing if I write chronologically? Rewriting it. Para yeah, just paraphrasing it rather than analysing it. I'm in danger of running out of time before I get to the end. What if my hour's up and I've only made it to here? And all the good stuff's here. So don't ever let me see you do it chronologically, right? There is a safety to that. There's a, okay, I'll just work through my points. You're not going to get out of band. You might get into band four competent, but you're not going to get out of band four into band five. Good. Okay, let's dive straight in. An hour earlier when the two officials of the People's Commissariat of the Interior were hammering on Rubishov's door in order to arrest him, Rubishov was just dreaming that he was being arrested. Okay, so we're doing together now the skim and the scan kind of at the same time. And then when we plan on the grid together, we'll be doing the scour, all right? I'm feeling out of sorts because I don't have my fountain pen. It's making me feel a little bit uneasy. I don't, I don't like it. But tell me what I'm putting here. How, it, does that opening tell me it's dystopian? Why, Layla? How? <laughs> right, okay. Someone wants to arrest him. So, as they were hammering on his door in order to arrest him, he was dreaming that he was being arrested. Go on. Not just the reality... But, go on, Ellie. No? Go on, Holly. Right, something about paranoia. Kind of justified paranoia here. Can you escape this regime? You can't, because you can't escape it even, he can't escape it in his dreams. Okay, lovely. Um, I am going to go pretty quickly through this, but because I'm feeling wonderfully kind, I did some notes on another extract yesterday, and I'll photocopy that for you as well. I do want to leave you some space for you to bring your own ideas as well, but this should give you enough over half term that nobody's going, I don't know where to start, in a very high-pitched voice. Put the helium balloons down over half term, you've had enough. The knocking had grown louder and Rubishov strained to wake up. He was practised in tearing himself out of nightmares as the dream of his first arrest had for years returned periodically and ran its course 
with the regularity of clockwork. Sometimes, by a strong effort of will, he managed to stop the clockwork, to pull himself out of the dream by his own effort, but this time he did not succeed. The last weeks had exhausted him. He sweated and panted in his sleep. The clockwork hummed. The dream went on. Right, Alfreda, tell me anything of import in that paragraph. The fact that there's a schedule to nightmares and dreams in which it shouldn't be controlled with sleep, that's so hard stretches Yeah, that is lovely. But not being able to escape. I'm just going to knock this fan off so we can't hear it on the back of the um, recording. You know, I like to be professional. Uh, we can open the door, though. Right, um, who would like to go next? Who would like to add to that, maybe, Genevieve? The idea of it being clockwork That's a lovely idea. And look what the clockwork is, is doing. First of all, the dream runs with the regularity of clockwork. Sometimes he does manage to stop the clock, but here the clockwork hummed. Tell me about that word, hummed. What effect is that creating? Now, as much as I love Genevieve, I don't want to turn into the Genevieve show again. So, let's have some other people being brave. If you get it wrong, what's the worst that can happen? Nada. Nothing. Clockwork hummed, the dream went on. Sarah Lily. Yeah, go on, why? And what effect is it having? Right, so it adds to Genevieve's point about kind of the clockwork, the man-made thing, but that, that it's going on, that that's the background pervasiveness. That's a nice word to use, isn't it? Pervasive. My other class told me off about my handwriting. Said it wasn't clear enough. They're so rude. Not your class, block six. Sufel. Um, I wrote that it was an extended metaphor of all ideas. It is, lovely. And of his life being controlled by it. Excellent. Now, I'm not saying that that's all there is in that section. But I'm trying to give you enough for each section that you've got something to say. He dreamed, as always, that there was a hammering on his door. And that three men stood outside waiting to arrest him. He could see them through the closed door, standing outside, banging against its framework. They had on brand new uniforms, the becoming costume of the Praetorian Guards of the German dictatorship. On their caps and sleeves, they wore their insignia, the aggressively barbed cross. In their free hand, they carried grotesquely big pistols. Their straps and trappings smelled of fresh leather. OK, I'll pause there. So, 70s Hannah, any thoughts? Right, so, pistols, harm, violence. What about this word, Hannah, grotesquely? Mimi? Um, it's just the, like, unnecessarily large, so they're not, it's not for use, it's to show its face. Yes. I can carry this weapon and I can carry it. Yes, it's exactly that. If something is grotesquely big, it's kind of unnecessary, isn't it? And it's that show of force as well. Lovely. Emily, anything else there? What about these uniforms being brand new? Um, Do you want me to come back to you? Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? If the uniforms are brand new, might suggest... Again, this is speculation. We don't have to know... But I'm just wondering what that's telling us about this dystopian regime. Hmm? New. Right, so the regime itself might be relatively new. And then look, let's look at who's wearing them. Two were overgrown peasant lads, thick lips, fish eyes. The third was short and fat. Are those the kind of... Oh, sorry, go on, Hannah. Um, 
because they'll just be like him and blue fog. Um, or if it was like internet distribution of wealth, so like it was Lovely. So like a reward for being part of that regime. So can you see how weirdly AO5 plays a part in this? It's not an assessment objective, but you have to use your own interpretation. That's good. Keep going, though. Would we exp go on, Ellie? Um, would it be surprising not to say that the, the actual people who are wearing the military scheme? Yeah. So say like younger generation. And and how is that supported by the description of the men? Poor lads. Lads, yep. Yeah. And they're peasants, and they're fat. Would we expect to see fat peasant lads? No, we wouldn't. When you think about like. The, the German soldiers. So what, what does that tell us if even fat peasant lads are wearing this uniform? They might be desperate for soldiers. Or... 70s, Hannah? So they're kind of inexperienced, they're just, they're, they're not real soldiers, they're just performing it. Right, good. So just to keep that threat going, lovely. Alfreda? Yeah. Lovely. A becoming would mean that it kind of suits them. It's just like, oh, that dress is very becoming. You know, brings out your eyes. But here, you know, I wonder if I think there's also maybe a suggestion. Um, yeah, they could be desperate for soldiers, or again, the kind of pervasiveness. Like, like like everybody wants to join, even the fat peasant lads. I don't know which it is, and it doesn't matter, as long as I can just say why I think that's kind of symbolic of uh, dystopian fiction. So I'm reminded there of somebody like um, Mr. Parsons, who you know has to who goes around in his shorts and his basically his Boy Scout uniform as much as possible because he's so desperate to join in to be part of the party in some way. So at this point, actually, we haven't done any AO3. We haven't made any links to wider reading. So maybe um, that's a good point to put something in, AO3 Parsons. Now, in terms of your wider reading, um, I'm not expecting to see much at all. You might be able to make some links to 1984. You might, for those of you, for example, who've read, I don't know, Brave New World, if that's relevant. But don't stress about that at all. It's just the analysis of the scene that I'm much more interested in. And over time, we will build up our wider reading um, bank. Because the wider reading we've done so far has more just been to get a sense of the historical movement of the genre. They stood by his bed, holding their pistols in their hands and breathing heavily at him. It was quite still, save for the asthmatic panting of the short, fat one. There's another bit about kind of the unsuitability of this soldier. You don't normally let men into the army who have asthma. Then someone in an upper story pulled a plug and the water rushed down evenly through the pipes in the walls. The clockwork was running down. The hammering on Rubishov's door became louder. The two men outside who had come to arrest him hammered alternatively and blew on their frozen hands. At this point, then, I'd argue that we don't know exactly whether we're in the dream or in reality. And it's that blurring of the boundaries that is very distinctively dystopian. 
are not exclusively dystopian. We get this in horror and in fantasy. Um, but it's all about that inescapability. Okay. Bert Rubishoff. We like that name. It's a good name for a dog, I think. Rubishoff. Could not wake up, although he knew that now would follow a particularly painful scene. Right, everybody have a look at what comes after this colon. What's happening there grammatically? Dan C? Um. I'm not really sure. Okay, it's all right. Dan B. Okay, anybody? The three still stand by his bed and he tries to put on his dressing gown, but the sleeve is turned inside out. He cannot manage to put his arm into it. Genevieve? It's gone to present tense, hasn't it? What's that doing? How's that affected the scene and how it feels, the atmosphere or the tone? Go on, Dan, see what happens when it's in present tense. Does it make it feel like more, real, more realistic? It's not actually a dream anymore. Yeah, it's, that, it's, the, it's the immediacy, isn't it? Remember this whole, the overarching kind of idea of this piece is of entrapment, of, in, of inescapability, and of, of violence. And now the violence is kind of like, he can't even um, get his dressing gown on. Layla? Um, um, yes, it definitely does, doesn't it? Have, uh, do, have any of you had those dreams where you can't... My, mine are often that I'm driving and I can't get either get my foot... My, my foot often gets trapped underneath the pedals, so I can't hit the brake, or I can't like, and I'm that that trappage. That's the word we have for it in our house. You know, like when you can't get your top off or something, and it's got stuck. I must turn my kid all the time because he's got a massive head, and he gets a bit panicked, and we and we shout trappage, and someone comes to our aid. No, nope, just my house then. Right, well I gift you that. If that happens to you again, you can shout trappage. I'll hear it with my super sense and I'll come and rescue you. He strives vainly until a kind of paralysis descends on him. He cannot move, although everything depends on his getting the sleeve on in time. I've had nothing but dreams like that for the last few nights, actually. They've been horrible. Was it your class I was telling about? I often have dreams about having to squeeze through windows and stuff. And I had one last night, and this person who was pulling me through said, <sighs> we were pulling me through this really small little window, and they said, other people manage this more easily because they have four stomachs. <laughs> I, I found myself apologising in my dream for not having four stomachs. Anyway, I digress. Sorry, it's been recorded. Offset will probably suck me on that basis. Um, now, that perhaps sounds like hyperbole, but in fact... In the context of this dream and this regime, we know that sometimes the smallest acts are of the greatest significance, don't we? This tormenting helplessness, what a lovely phrase. The juxtaposition of those words there. Lasts a number of seconds during which Rubishoff moans and feels the cold wetness on his temples. So like the physical sensations are there. And the hammering on his door penetrates his sleep like a distant roll of drums. So sometimes, look, I'm just I'm just showing you where the Sameo 2 but I'm not telling you what necessarily you should do with it. His arm under the pillow twitches in the feverish effort to find the sleeve of his dressing gown. Then at last he is released 
by the first smashing blow over the ear with the butt of the pistol. So I want you to consider there the fact that he's being released by a violent blow. There's something deeply ironic about that, isn't there? What is he being released into? Okay, so on this final paragraph then, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and underline a few things. Then I'm going to stop the recording and ask you. So basically, I started off showing you what to do and then we annotated quite a bit of it together and now with a bit of prompting i'm going to ask you on your tables to say i'm going to highlight it but you're going to do the annotating yes lucy can you what you got the toilet yeah <laughs> okay so I'm not expecting you to comment on everything. Okay, so again, I've highlighted a lot of things there. This section um, I've given you today is, I think, longer than, than that which you would be given in an exam. But remember, we're not just practicing exam technique here, but we're using this for wider reading as well. So uh, it was important to give you this, and this is why it's different to the one that's in your um, little booklet so on your tables then, please, how would you start to annotate those pieces that I've underlined? I'll take some feedback and then together we'll go through one of my planning grids and I'm going to invite you at that point to get a Chromebook because it's electronic and we can kind of fill in bits of it together. Um, okay, good.